So welcome to Research Tuesday, um, and it is great to see so many people here. Um, my name's Bob Hill. I'm the director of the University of Adelaide's Environment Institute. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here to introduce Dr Liz Reid, tonight's speaker. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains, and the lands on which the University of Adelaide's campuses here at North Terrace, at Roseworthy and Waite are built. Um, as director of the Environment Institute, uh, I get to do a few really neat things. And one of the things I think when I do get a chance to put my feet up and think about what I've achieved, um, it's attracting some really star people to the University of Adelaide. Um, and there will probably be three, I think, maybe four, that I really take some pride in. And tonight's speaker most certainly is one of those. Um, it was fantastic from my perspective to be able to attract Liz to come to the University of Adelaide. I thought I understood her reputation um, and I thought she was well worth getting. I had no idea how good Liz was. Um, she has an amazing capacity for uh, very hard work, really clear thinking, an absolute commitment to the problem that she's, uh, she's taken on. Um, she also has an incredible capacity to build really impressive uh, cross-disciplinary research teams. And I mean, I wish I had half her skill in that area. So it's been amazing, the talent that she's drawn together to work on this particular site. So it is a great pleasure for me to introduce Liz. And I also think um, in letting her loose that she's got the coolest title that I've seen for Research Tuesday. So will you please uh, join me in welcoming Liz Reid. Thank you. And I can't even claim that title, <laughs> that was, uh, but it's, it is a good one. Thank you for coming along to hear about Narracourt Caves. I plan to have most people convinced this is one of the best places you could possibly go and I imagine that you've all been there and if you haven't, then I'm sure after seeing all of these wonderful photographs, I'm going to show you that you'd love to go to see the caves. Caves really are places of wonder, well they are for me, but they're important and fragile terrestrial ecosystems and I think the caves have become a fantasy place. We see some terrible Hollywood movies making caves all out to be all different sorts of things, but caves are really important ecosystems and they are part of ecosystems that have been here for hundreds of thousands of years and they've been collecting faithful records of those. They really are underground archives of natural history. I often say caves are nature's history books. And if you think about the caves have been collecting and preserving records of what's going on around them for thousands of years. So biodiversity, environment, human culture. And some cave systems, or well, even though they're all wonderful if you're a cave addict, but some cave systems such as Narracourt in South Australia also preserve exceptional fossil records. Now those of us who work in caves are fascinated by all the diversity and it's not really a glamorous job as you can see. Um, this is kind of the usual working position here, just uh, crawling into some dark hole and I know I have some cavers here today. But really to get to see things that, that most people will never get to see and experience is a great privilege and one that I've really enjoyed and coincidentally um, almost to the day, it's 23 years ago since I first set foot at Narracourt as an undergraduate. And one of the really amazing things that we got to do as undergraduate students was excavate fossil material, real fossil material. And of course, I was terrified, as I've seen countless other volunteers since me. You know that you're dealing with something very, very important, but at least when they let you loose, they're just very small tools. As you can see here, we have a team from University of Adelaide and South Australia Museum, and we were conducting a cave rehabilitation work at uh, Narracourt Caves, and we're uncovering a floor that had been uh, water damaged. So you can see very, very carefully peeling away sediment from calcite flowstone, using small brushes and dental picks, 
and you'll even see shortly using a toothpick, a toothbrush to actually clean that formation. So I guess the moral of this particular story is that this is painstaking, slow work. It is not something for the impatient. And I think caves certainly teach you that. They teach you to be disciplined and they teach you to be patient and work hard for results. So Narracourt is in the limestone coast region of South Australia. I'm sure you all know where that is, but just in case. So when you'll know which way to drive when you go visit. The limestone coast is, and Narracourt Caves are part of a grand story that is the fossil record of South Australia. And I've often said South Australia is one giant fossil, fossil locality, and I'm, I'm not sure that everyone appreciates to the extent that is. I mean it in a purely scientific sense there from the back. <laughs> we have everything from the first multicellular organisms, the Ediacaran fauna. We have wonderful uh, Cambrian fossils that we see in Kangaroo Island. We have Cretaceous marine reptiles, some of them opalized. We have early um, megafauna and marsupials, diprotodon graveyards from Lake Calabona. And for those of us who are very much into caves, we have amazing caves in the southeast, Flinders Ranges, and the Nullarbor, to mention a few. But there are three iconic places that, and I, I've chosen these because they are globally significant. We have, and I'm going to put these into context for you. So the three I'm ta talking about are Ediacara, Emu Bay Shales in Kangaroo Island and the Narracourt Caves. So here's a geological time scale. So if we accept that we're going from older to younger, I couldn't possibly stretch that out into one side. I'm just going to put into context for you because I'm sure some of you have heard the wonderful uh, talks by Diego Garcia Bolido about Ediacra and Jim Galing about their work. So here we have the Ediacra. I'm trying to put the context of Narracourt in time for you. 550 to 560 million years ago, first multicellular life. We have the Cambrian explosion and we see the amazing armoured animals from Emu Bay at around 513 million. And then let's go right up to the top. We're at Narracourt Caves, the last half a million years of fossil history. And I have had people say that I work in the topsoil. <laughs> However, I will convince you, I hope, that there are great advantages of working in the topsoil, one of which is resolution. Things get a lot clearer the closer you are. So these caves, this is the wonderful Blanche Cave at Narracourt. These are limestone caves. And I'm not going to go into the development of these too much, but suffice to say these caves developed about one million years ago or so. And this limestone itself, the caves at Narracourt are formed in the Narracourt member of the Gambia limestone, which is about 15 million years old. And over time in that limestone, caves developed, a combination of groundwater and also structural uh, factors. And entrances opened up to the surface. And that's when it got exciting for people like me, because once you've got a hole, things can fall into it. And those things can be animals, they can be sediments, they can be all sorts of things that we as scientists use to understand. And as that fossil record is cumulative, so has the story of the research. So I thought it'd be a good point to actually go back to the beginning, the first discoveries that were published of fossils. And we have here one of my all-time favourite people, Reverend Julian Tennyson Woods, looking rather dapper there in his early years. He was quite insightful and he described the caves as a world of wonders and I'm going to keep with that theme today. And he was going through the caves. I don't think he's very brave woods because he declared the deeper caves as having very little interest. <laughs> he kept to the shallower ones, particularly the 60-foot cave he, he deemed was of little interest. But he said that the majority of the material he found was small. And you can see here, these are actually rodents and small marsupials, things that were still around today. 
And at the time, I sort of get a sense of a little bit of megafauna envy from Woods because in his book in 1862, he had an appendix dedicated to megafauna. He talked about the great finds at Wellington Caves in New South Wales. Little did he know, though, a metre below his feet where he was collecting these things were megafauna. But many of us would argue now that these little animals are probably going to tell us more in the long run about the ancient environment. And Wood saw that we would need many years of work to actually work through all this. There's Father Woods in 1860. Coincidentally, this was the first photograph taken in an Australian cave. And he's posed rather conspicuously there because he wanted this for his book. So he wanted to look quite adventurous. But the caves didn't start off as something that was a scientific resource. They were something that people came to see because they liked going into caves. It was a pleasure resort. And you can see here people in Blanche Cave in 1890 and that sort of sense of mystery, that Victorian attitude to nature, nature as a curiosity, was well and truly alive. So people would sample stalagmites and tights and take them with them because it's okay because they'll grow back very quickly. <laughs> so they got titles like nature's dungeons. There's always got to be one, doesn't there? <laughs> and you can see the candles and people going through. So this became eventually under the control of the Forestry Board and then later the Tourism Bureau, and it became a major tourism attraction. Here is the opening of Alexandra Cave in um, 1909. Two and a half thousand people came, and they tried hard to protect the caves while still show people around. You can see chicken wire fences and even little funnels to protect the bones, uh, to protect the stalactites. But where were the fossils? They didn't seem to rate. I got a record of a small collection of what was called guano. It was just small material found in, in sediment in Blanche Cave in 1888. When um, Alexandra Cave was discovered in 1908, some material of megafauna was found. It was the first megafauna. Again, another coincidence. It's 100 years. So that signifies the museum's involvement with the caves because the director then came down to collect those bones. Later in the, the 1950s, material was found, uh, Phylacalia carnifex, the mustabule lion, there's a complete hand found in a quarry in town. But in the late 1960s, some really big finds um, were happening around the Narracourt area. And it's for one, my, in my view, one very simple reason, cavers. The Cave Exploration Group of South Australia started in 1955 and they had a bit of a motto to go by, exploration without documentation is nothing but idle curiosity. And so that is the heart of cave exploration, documenting, mapping, surveying and, and giving a record of these natural wonders. As soon as cavers were on the scene, all of a sudden these caves are full of fossils. People were actually tuned into them. And the big discovery came in 1969 when uh, an extension to the Victoria Cave was discovered. We have at least one of the discoverers sitting right here, Grant, Grant Gartrell, and Rod Wells was also on that group, and Bob Hensel and others. And Rod then started researching those. He was an Adelaide Uni student at the time when he discovered, so there's, there's something for you, As PhD students, get into the field. And he later had a very long and celebrated career at Flinders University. And he recognised initially that there's potential not just for the research, but also for tourism and education. And he, he encouraged the government to start the first underground museum. And for 50 years, science has been the lifeblood of this place. And it's World Heritage listed due to that science. The locals were immensely proud of what they had. They took hold of this richest find of Ice Age fossilised bones in the world. And you can see the mayor saying, look, you know, I know they're pretty, but I reckon these fossils are going to be what people come for eventually. And boy, was he right. And come they did, even very famous people like David Attenborough, who I'm told was not overly keen at joining the cave exploration group after that trip. He, uh, but he got out there and he was photographed and Narracourt appeared on his Life on Earth show. So we had international recognition. We've gone from this picnic ground, this place of curiosity and attraction and fantasy 
to a scientific hub. And that ultimately led to World Heritage listing. So Narracourt Caves is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, was listed in 1994 with the remarkable site of Riversley in northwestern Queensland. And together, those sites show us the story of the evolution of many of Australia's mammals and other groups. They're known as the Australian Fossil Mammal Sites. And there were two criteria under which they were listed. The first is to be outstanding examples representing major stages in Earth's history, including the record of life, which they certainly are. Here's a scene from the Osheries, and that's not staged. This is what going to Narracourt looks like. Wherever you see red dirt, you see bones. The second criteria, criterion to be outstanding examples representing significant ongoing ecological and biological processes in the evolution and development of life. That's a key because remember we talked about the topsoil, many of these fossils are still warm in that they're still falling in today. These caves are still collecting material and information right now. So this record goes from over half a million years ago to yesterday afternoon around about lunchtime. And why that's important is that we have continuity with this, this biological surveyors that are the caves um, in light of climate change and environmental change. So it gives us a baseline against which to assess the changes in modern ecosystems. Okay, so why is it such a good locality? And it's important to know that the Anaracourt Caves really is a Rolls-Royce locality. Not all of them have as much information and materials as we have at Narracourt. One of the really great things about it is that we have very well stratified or layered deposits with little evidence of disruption in a major way. A lot of cave systems have mass water flow, a lot of material gets turned upside down and, and even removed, but these caves tend to be literally like tombs that are sealed. It's also a very extended time period, so half a million years, the last half a million years. A lot's gone on in that time. And one of the key things, if you're interested in the fossils I'm talking about, is megafauna extinction. And how amazing that we have not one, but many sites that do this. They go from about 13,000 quite young, and they go straight through the megafauna extinction boundary, which is that blue line and beyond. So we can look at patterns of extinction before and after the extinctions happened. They collect lots of dirt, vast quantities of sediment that was remnant from ancient dune systems, coastal dune systems, and this material buries the bones. The other remarkable thing is not just one cave, there are hundreds of caves in the limestone coast and a couple of hundred or more around Narracourt, not just the ones on the park. And you can see here they all tend to line up with the old dune system and by having lots of sites in one place, we can get replicates, which is really rare. So we can get sites that are replicating the same period of time, the same animals, and we can start to even out some of the biases that individual sites might have and tell the full story. And we're getting a bit clever these days at doing this. One of the things we, we really want to do is what's the extent of this system and how does it fit in with each other? How does it connect? So we now have a 3D scanner in our arsenal of, uh, of tools. And this is an amazing device because it allows us to scan in very, very fine resolution the caves in three dimensions. And it also allows us to scan the land surface and then we can tie all these together. So I've got in my head this vision of having this whole system in 3D and we can see the relationships between the, the systems. Not all of them had wine barrels. <laughs> this one is on private land with one of our industry partners. And we'll fly out to the cave in a minute and you'll see how, how level and how flat these caves can, can be. Thanks to Martin Ankor, who's our resident expert on this, um, helps a lot. That's certainly not um, my specialty. So we've got great resolution, lots of strata, tick. The next thing, we need to be able to know time. You know, if we're doing who and what, we need to know when. 
We need to know the age of these deposits. And you can imagine having so many fine layers, it's important if we want to tease out the full story to get that time factor. Again, we've got an embarrassment of riches. We can use multiple techniques to date the sand grains themselves. We can date the calcite formations. We can date the bones. We can date um, charcoal, pollen, basically anything that's datable in a cave, we have it. Here we have a section in specimen cave showing cave calcite layers with sediment and bones. There's actually megafauna bones embedded in that flowstone. We have a piece of charcoal in section we can date. We can also use these for paleoenvironment. Of course, these wonderful speleothems, as we call them, they're not just pretty faces. They actually tell us a lot about the climate. And here's um, Professor Nigel Spooner from the University of Adelaide sampling with um, OSL dating. In a nutshell, it tells us the last time sand grains were exposed to sunlight, which is remarkable. The last few years we've been able to do some fun things with the dating. One of them is we kept excavating little pieces of straw stalactite. What to do with all these straws? Well, you can actually use uranium series dating and date those. And so we did some work with um, colleagues from the University of Queensland. And what we found, here's these little straws. What we found is when we plotted out the straw ages, which are the little squares, with the radiocarbon ages, they matched really well. So these little straws were actually falling off at about the same rate the sediments in this cave were forming. So it gives us, again, another tool in our kit. These wonderful flowstones and stalagmites have bands of growth, and we can also date those using uranium series. And some pioneering work was done in the late 90s by Linda Ayliff and colleagues. And it looked at dating, taking samples from a whole bunch of stalagmites uh, around the Narracourt Caves. And what they found were there were four main growth periods, and they corresponded those to cooler time periods. And they described wet phases and drier phases. Really interesting work. We're revisiting this actually at the moment with colleagues from the University of Melbourne, so watch this space, but suffice to say we already have three or four times as many dates, and we're seeing growth throughout. So that's interesting. We have plenty of speleothems. So we've got time. How about environment? And this is where, in recent years, the work at Narracourt's taken on a new dimension. The sediments themselves give us a wealth of material. It's a nice thin section here showing, whoop. I'll just go back a bit. So showing charcoal, seeds, sand grains. We can use isotopic studies, chemical studies of the sediments to tell us about environment. We can look at pollen. We can look at diatoms. We've only just started working that with um, John Tibby and students. Land snails can give us temperature through carbon isotopes. Georgina Falston, John Tyler has been working on that. Um, I don't know how many children are here, but the kids always love the scats. We have preserved scats. Who would imagine a 20,000, 50,000 year old possum toilet would be interesting, but those scats contain seeds and pollen grains and things that give us information about the environment. Of course, we have the wonderful speleothems I spoke about, and one of the most remarkable newer finds has been plant remains. These are some of the macro plant fossils Bob's working on, Catherine Hill, and others, Jessica McInerney, Sean Howard. Um, we have really good intact fossils, and they are fossils, of things like shea cone seeds. You can see this eucalyptus leaf in situ here at around 16,000 years. It's hard to tell them from the modern. They're in such good condition. Here's some um, bracken fern, and this is a fossil. On this side, same species as today. And some really good work students have been doing for summer projects with Catherine has shown some really delicate structures, blossoms and various things that have been preserved and we can match those to living species. So Phalaris aside in this next photo, if you'd have gone bushwalking in Narracourt 300,000 years ago, you wouldn't have said, said to yourself, gee, I am in a totally alien landscape. You would have recognised 
the Australian bush. It's just that you would have seen some two and a half thousand kilogram megafauna walking around. <laughs> so we had all that wonderful environmental information, time, and layers of time. You've got to have fossils. And boy, does Naracor have fossils. The excellence of its fossil preservation is, was noted in its World Heritage listing. The material is exceptional. And here we have just a few examples. Uh, skull of the giant Echidna megalobguilia. There'll be a test on how to say that later. One of the extinct giant short-faced kangaroos. Complete articulated specimens. This is a hand of the marsupial lion. And wonderful material from small animals. See lots of little jaws here. And this tiny little bat. That's 20,000 years old, that bat. And look how perfect it is. I've got a soft spot for bat fossils. The other really great thing a fossil site can have is lots of ways that the record has accumulated. So, for example, if you just had one type of accumulation, say, pitfall, so everything fell into the cave, what you're going to do is have a, a deposit that bias towards things that fall into caves. And I tell you from experience, kangaroos are superstars at falling into caves. 75% <laughs> of the large fauna from Victoria Fossil Cave is kangaroos. So they've never learned. In half a million years, they're still falling down holes. But if you get something that's slow and you know, not sort of likely to, to fall in or can climb out, they're going to be missing from your record. But Naracourt also has other ways that fossils got into the caves. We have predator assemblages, things where things like devils brought material in, owl deposits where owls brought in uh, pellets containing the prey of their, their small vertebrates. And we have some animals that actually live in caves, possums, bats, a whole number of things. A lot of the reptiles that we see, I'm sure, actually lived in the caves at times. So this gives us a good representation of the original community. And of course, I'll spend a little bit of time on this now because everyone loves to hear about them, a very rich record of megafauna. I wonder if you can tell what's poking out of the sediment there. This is Victoria Fossil Cave. And you're looking literally up the noses of two extinct kangaroos that were buried there about 300,000 years ago. You can see their incisor teeth. And kangaroos are the great success story, the amazing story of megafauna at Naracourt. Animals like the 250 kilogram Procoptodon goliath. These animals have special adaptations on their teeth, lots of folds in the enamel that allow them to chew up leaves instead of grass. Cymostenurus occidentalis, this animal was about the mid-range weight for the stenuring kangaroos. We even had some that were actually barely megafauna at only about 30 kilos. But all up, we had nine species of these extinct kangaroos once roaming Naracourt's forests. You think about that diversity, it's gone now. It's such a shame. But with all these yummy kangaroos around, we had to have a major predator. Enter Thylacoleo carnifex. Now this animal is kind of like a, related to a koala and a wombat. It's a marsupial, so all of the rest of its major group are herbivores, but this one was adapted for eating meat. This was a wonderful reconstruction, possibly a bit too lion-like, but we're working on it, done by the Kennis brothers, who recently did the Cheddar Man. You might have heard about that. And this was done from a skull found at Naracourt, here, which I have right here. It's a cast, and it's got a bad paint job. But This one was found in a quarry in town, and it shows really well that this animal had these gigantic blade-like slicing teeth. So this was a steak eater, no chewing up dog bones for this guy. This used to eat flesh. And there's some thought that it may also have gone into caves. This is one I prepared earlier. So from that... The Kenneth brothers were able to put a, a face to that animal. It, all of a sudden, when I tell you that it could climb trees, it becomes rather a fun thing to be walking around in the bush. The original drop bear, perhaps. 
Narracourt played a key role in understanding the, this animal. Rod Wells did a lot of work on this and in recently really well preserved specimens from the foot allowed Rod and the team to actually piece together this uh, scansorial habitat, habit. Sorry. But there are other things perhaps more terrifying. One of the wonderful things about Narracourt is they're still finding new things. Uh, in about 2004, a cave was uncovered in a vineyard and we went to have a look. And in there, we found this rather puzzling little bone, about this big. We knew it was a lizard, but lizards shouldn't be that big at Narracourt. So it got put away for a while, and then we came to terms with the fact that this belonged to this gigantic monitor lizard, Varanus priscus. Not a candidate for falling down a hole, but this one was brought in by a devil. This was an ancient devil den. And there is this a baby, this is a youngster, next to an adult Goanna, humorous. We also have this amazing snake, Winambi narracortensis, which was first described from Narracourt. This is a sculpture outside the Winambi Centre, the nest robber. And that's a picture of some vertebrae discovered uh, in the fossil chamber in about 1974 and described by Meredith Smith. Here's some cranial elements described later by Scanlon et al. And there's a rather, shall I say, fanciful sculpture in the foyer of the Winambi Centre um, of Thylacoleo and Winambi fighting. Uh, anatomical sort of uh, accuracy is limited. <laughs> in some cases, shall I say, <laughs> but it looks good. Recent work uh, by Ellen Shute and colleagues from Flinders has given us more information about this giant megapode, it used to be known as Pregura, but it still has the Narracortensis, which means that this particular one is found at Narracourt and it comes from Narracourt. Now, I'm really pleased to have been involved with working on a lot of um, sites on private land that we were able to source a lot of the material from this, including the skull, which came from the same quarry as that uh, big guy there. And you can see, compared to a modern brush turkey, um, these are quite big animals. And there's one small record of the gigantic Jenny Ornus, 200-odd kilo bird from Blanche Cave. It's one tiny little vertebra, and that's all. But still, it's, it's showing the diversity. And there are others that were really interesting animals, like Megalobguilia, which is a giant long-beaked echidna, and one that was only first discovered at Narracot Caves in 2012, and that's Propliopus ocellans. I don't like the sort of whole carnivorous kangaroo persona that one's given. It's probably more of an omnivorous animal, but still about the size of a red kangaroo and immediately identifiable by this big blade-like premolar tooth. This has only been found in about eight sites across Australia. It's a very, very rare <laughs> fossil. And of course, where would we be without the megafauna heavyweights? Diprotodon optatum, two and a half thousand kilogram marsupial. Recent work by Gilbert Price and colleagues from Queensland suggests they migrated. So they, were, they were moved around in groups. Heard of diprotodons would have been quite a sight. But we had others too at Narracourt, Zygomaturus, um, about half a tonne and suggested possibly <coughs> swamp dwelling, but we do get a lot of it in the temperate woodland habitat as well. And Palacestes with a long nose that could use that to manipulate vegetation. And here is Diprotodon at the Nambi Centre. Many a person has regretted climbing this particular sculpture. But that's about three metres long and two and a bit wide. But this seems to be something between his toes. Look at that. <laughs> They're not all big, the animals at Narracourt. We get so excited about the megafauna, but this is from one extreme to the other, the major and the minor. And I think it's really fascinating what these small animals are really going to reveal about the big, big guys. And we get lots of animals, small bones in Narracourt, as you can see thousands and thousands of them. Here's some rodents amongst here, little limb bones, and we spend many hours sorting through these. So another reason why these records are so amazing is because there's sufficient diversity, there's enough species, so far 135 species and counting. And a lot of them you just, you know today because they're still around. 
things like antichinus and quolls, all the frogs that we find in the deposits are still living there, snakes, salapid snakes, lizards, birds, kangaroos, wombats, bats. So we get frogs, birds, reptiles and mammals, that's really important. And about 20% of those became extinct during the Pleistocene. So that gives us a, a huge amount that aren't megafauna, if we want to use megafauna as Pleistocene. Nearly half of those are locally extant. So they give us an opportunity. Who would think that fossils could save the future? Fossils can tell us a lot about conserving modern species. And there was a, an article out today saying we should be ashamed of the level of extinctions that are going on. The fossil record can aid with that. Here's one example where paleoconservation is becoming quite an interesting field. I've been working on the bat fossils at Narracourt. We have a critically endangered bat at Narracourt, the southern bentwing bat. And I've done some excavations in recent years of sites where this bat still actually is living. And having a look at the record of bats at Narracourt, we see that these are just the, so this is now, and this is going back 700,000. These are deposits, the time span. The bat fossil record goes back for the whole half a million years. And the fascinating thing is it's just about one species. It's the same species. And if we have a look at where they, their bones are found, it's in the same places that they're using today. So they are literally roosting above their own fossil record. Isn't that fascinating? So that's telling us that these bats have relied on these caves for half a million years to be able to winter, to be able to breed. Any change in the past environment, climate, they probably had lots of options to go other places. But since we've been here, we've destroyed a lot of the habitat. They've got nowhere to go. So even a few degrees temperature rise could make some of these caves too warm for them to winter in. And that would be drastic consequences. So this one's showing us the cave habitat is the key. We have to protect that at all costs. So let's just go through, I guess, what we have in our toolkit for studying Narracourt. We've got wonderful layers in the background there. We've got our fauna and flora, which give us biodiversity. We've got our climate and environment and time from all the materials I've talked about, speleothems, carbon, etc. And we've got this complex story of how it all got there, which helps inform us about how reliable that record is telling us about the past. So where are we at? And, and what are we missing, more importantly? So this diagram shows us, similar to the other one, this is age along here, from zero years to 800,000. It's roughly the time of the dune system formation. Each of these lines is a cave deposit, the span of time that it covers. Some of these are ones we've just been working on recently. This is the whole Narracourt record combined. Here's the megafauna extinction boundary. And you would have noticed the big gap between 100 to 200,000. So far, we don't have deposits in that time frame. I'm sure it's not because they're not there. We probably just need to push some of these deposits further. And some of the deposits, like the, the most diverse, the Victoria Fossil Cave, the dating of that really is uncertain. We have to go back to the drawing board on a lot of these sites and actually redate them and rework them because we, we don't know some key things about them. Does the record extend any further? Another really interesting question, and one we're actually tackling by dating speleothems to see if they push past half a million years. Remember I talked about the cumulative nature of the fossil deposits and the cumulative nature of the science. This is a little diagram that gives you an idea of that. So along here we've got time, just key events. Discovery of the caves here in 1845. So this little graphic shows you what we knew then compared to what we know now in recent years. So you can see we started off knowing we had some bones, small bones. And over the years, we've added that with megafauna, small vertebrates, studies of the sediments, dating, studies of the speleothems, moving on to new techniques and multiple sites. 
looking at isotopic studies of sediments about past climate. And in 2008, I decided to start to take the research in a different direction a bit and see if we had other proxies, vegetation, etc. So that work added, again, pollen, phytoliths, plant, macrofossils, land snails, diatoms, and new sites. We keep finding new sites. That's the great thing about Narracourt. People ring all the time with new caves. And in just in the last couple of years, having access to the amazing multidisciplinary team here, we have added to that even more. <laughs> So now we've got ancient DNA, and that was done in uh, 2016 with some colleagues from Western Australia and Flinders and Adelaide, and now we've got fossil leaf waxes from leaf cuticles. We're doing applied paleoconservation. We're searching for volcanic traces from eruptions. We're um, starting to do the 3D mapping, and when we get all of this work together, we're actually in position to actually make correlations with other locations. And this is not a job for one person. And there's people missing on this because we've just had five new honours students start on Narracourt projects, which is wonderful. Uh, if they're here, I'm sorry, I haven't got your picture up yet. The ones we have with a box around their names are the chief investigators and partner investigators on a project I'm going to talk about next. So I won't go through every single person. Suffice to say, there's actually more people that aren't on here but this is a very collaborative project with a lot of specialists. It's a huge project that needs a big team. Last year, we were very lucky to have uh, a linkage project, ARC linkage project funded. We called it Narracourt Caves, a critical window on faunal extinctions and past climate. And it's a four-year project, and the project value is around $1.8 million. This is the biggest funding the caves have ever received for research. Certainly the biggest ARC funding, so really quite significant. And University of Adelaide is the lead organisation. Our research partners, uh, University of Queensland and University of Melbourne, amongst others. But I think the fantastic story lies with our partners. We have partners here that are locals, local to Narracourt. The Narracourt Lucendale Council has really backed this project. They've put heavily invested in a science project because they understand the caves as their point of difference. And without the science, there's no new stories about the caves. And the wine industry has come behind us with Terra Terra and Rat and Bully Wine Region Association. It just so happens these caves with the Narracourt um, just happen to be in the middle of the Rat and Bully Wine Region. And we've worked closely with partners to protect caves and study them. One of the major dig sites is on private land. We also have the custodians of the Narracourt Caves, DUNA, the Department for Environment, Water and Natural Resources. They are the ones that translate our research into information that they can use for management, but also tell everyone about what we're doing. It's a wonderful place. You can see research happening. Nothing, as far as paleontology goes, in this state would be possible without the South Australia Museum. The South Australia Museum are a very key partner for us from a research aspect, from the collection management, from public outreach, and they have strongly supported this project as well. We also have involvement from DSTG Group, Defence Science, through Professor Spooner, who runs the Luminescence Lab here in Adelaide. So what do we plan on doing with all these people and all this time and money? Thinking about those gaps I talked about, thinking about, you know, we still have a lot of, we've been doing a lot of exploratory work, so we still have a ways to go as what do we do with all this now? The first step, though, is to fill in those gaps and establish a really continuous chronostratigraphic context. So I'm just meaning we want to date all the layers all the way through. We want to have no gaps in that record. Because until we have that, we won't be able to then place the animals and the plants and the environment against that. So that's very important. At the same time, we want to assess the sites that we have or we are working on for this project, the paleo community structure and dynamics of the animals over quite a considerable time span. And this, will, uh, work, this really builds on work that's been done um, for decades by others and in recent times, myself and a team. 
We'll be able to elucidate patterns of extinction, not just of megafauna, but also local extinctions, changes with environment. And we have some really interesting things at our disposal now with ACAD, the Australian Centre of Ancient DNA, and being able to use that to get genetic backgrounds to paleo communities. The next step of that, of course, is to look at the paleo climate, the paleo environment, and the paleo vegetation. So we've got time, we've got animals, we've got environment and habitat. So from looking at multiple sites, we'll be able to build up quite a record over time. And then using these findings to actually promote this amazing place. I mean, it's the best thing for me is telling people about it, is, is coming, having people come along and watch us. We had the, the work recently we did an Alexandra cave and there was a little child at one point who was hanging over the rail just watching. I think he would have stayed there all day. You know, people are really interested in this stuff and it's our job as publicly funded researchers to share that. But I've also talked about the fact that we have a conservation angle to this and we could potentially feed into conservation of the park, management of the site, the 3D mapping, for example, that's going to be very important for the park to have a um, really good high-res picture of all of the caves. And then everything that we do feeds into the park and the interpretation that goes to the public. So I'll just sort of touch on the key areas under each of those aims. So the first one is looking at the layers, the stratigraphy, across a whole range of sites, really studying that in great detail and then correlating layers between sites, trying to find the same patterns or the same time spans in different sites. Part of that is looking very closely at the sediments and also the processes that formed those deposits. And then, of course, the geochronology, dating all of that. That is our sort of brief for aim one. Looking at the fauna, there are still animals to be discovered at Naracor, and there still are still sites where there's material lying unstudied. So we, again, we plan on filling some gaps in the animal record as well. And there's new sites we're working on uh, that we have a pretty good idea that they will fit that gap time-wise. Therefore, they give us a whole new 100,000 years of animals. Using taphonomy, the processes of burial, to guide us, it's kind of like forensic paleontology, will help us understand the limits of that record. And then using techniques like um, ancient DNA will help us go a bit deeper into the, the community dynamics. The paleo vegetation, paleo climate and fire history work is, is a really huge part of this project and a lot of this has not been done at all before and we aim to use multiple lines of evidence to see how we can uh, sort of flesh out this record. Fire history is going to be a very interesting one and we do that by looking at micro charcoal that's preserved in the layers. And of course, using all of the information we get through public outreach, events, through guide training, through working with natural resource managers to see if we can inform conservation, but also how we can manage the caves themselves. I often joke now that 10 scientists can work out of a teaspoon of dirt these days. So our, while we know more, our impact is less. So a premier site like the Narracourt Caves gives us a chance to actually develop some of the sort of key methods for tackling these things that are also cave friendly because don't forget these are delicate ecosystems within the caves. I've had pseudoscorpions meander across a dig square as I'm digging in a cave um, and I sort of just, okay, I'll just wait for you. These, we, we time our excavations to suit the bats. We don't excavate in the, in the bat cave in summer. So, so all of these things we have to take into account. And actually preserving the fossils for the future is important. You know, the fossil record really is in danger of becoming extinct, if you think about it. The way we are interfering with the surface of this planet, we have to keep that going. And Narracourt, of course, has a long tradition of showing off to the public. Being, you can go here and you can sit right where People are digging and you can hear about these things. You can see these bones firsthand. We've had uh, dioramas constructed that try to show what Narracourt was like in the past. 
and you can really see some amazing things. And the more we research, the more that will feed into that. So I think the science is dynamic and it brings new questions, new technologies. So science really brings these old bones to life. And the philosophy that's underpinned a lot of this work has been, can you sum up in this diagram for Narracourt Caves, science and research, conservation of the site and experiences for people all have to be equal. When one of those gets out of kilter, we can see things can happen that might not be great for the, for the site. If we saw science die there, for example, we'd lose a lot of the conservation and uh, visitor experiences. So once we tackle Narracourt, I kind of think of Narracourt as, as a, the benchmark site that we'll be able to judge a lot of others by and, and inform us. It makes sense to sort of branch out into other areas, and it's indeed what we're doing, is translating this work to other areas. So here's Narracourt, Tasmania. We've started doing some preliminary work there in caves. The South Australian side of the Nullarbor. And if you think about these as latitudinal gradients, that's kind of interesting. If we're looking at patterns across the same time at different latitudes, different climates, and then if we extend that to work, we're just starting with colleagues from Queensland, you get to really interesting stuff like comparing northern or tropical faunas with southern faunas and how they responded to events at the same time, where extinctions synchronous across the continent or were they different? Really interesting stuff. Just a couple of cool pics. I got the, got the logo in for the vehicle. Um, when they say the Nullarbor is plain, they mean it. <laughs> but there's some very interesting caves. Uh, we're really looking at very recent stuff over there. So again, more of that conservation, uh, so angled work. And you can see a team of cavers here. There's an, an Nullarbor exploration group. They have found over 3,000 features out there. We would have none of this without cave explorers. I cannot stress enough how wonderful it is to work with people that love these caves so much. And that might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I think that's quite inviting. A little um, crack in the rock in Tasmania that you wriggle into, and there's all sorts of wonderful things on the other side. It's just colder and muddier than the Nullarbor. So hopefully in years to come, we'll be able to take this model of work that we've done at Narracourt and, and work in other areas and build a bigger picture. So thank you for listening and I just wanted to acknowledge uh, research funding from the Australian Research Council, the Environment Institute, University of Adelaide, and our research partners. And I've also added here the Australian Speleological Federation, who we work closely with, and of course, check out our new paleontology major next year and our ecotourism degree. Paleotourism is a big thing, particularly in Queensland and South Australia. It's a developing field. The government's really interested in this and I think there's a lot of promise there. Thank you. Okay, we do have time for a couple of questions. There's a microphone up the back, so if anyone would like to ask, can you put, there's one up the back. Uh, fantastic presentation, thanks very much. Uh, my question um, <laughs> is to do when, when you come to one of these sites, um, how do you, how do, where do you start? What's the methodology? Um, and how do you ensure you get the most of it out of it? That's a really good question, one we get asked a lot. You know, how did you decide to dig there? Uh, one of the things with caves, and it doesn't matter where caves are, I think you do the hard yards, crawling through a lot of caves, looking at caves, and, and really developing a feel for how they work. And that really helps inform you of where you're going to get material, where you're going to get a good site. And I always like to take quite a conservative approach when we're sussing out new sites. So we might start off by doing um, some small cores to see if there's material and then if that pans out some, some preliminary ages and then go from there. 
So it it's, takes a while of, of looking at the sites and really thinking it through, uh, but I, I really do think that takes a fair bit of experience. Are these animals that you're discovering in the caves, in the caves unique to Australia, like the kangaroos, or are they worldwide? Certainly the ones that we're working with at Narracord at this, this end of the record are uniquely Australian animals. But we certainly do have, when we look at some of the older records, there are some strong links with faunas, marsupial faunas particularly, let's just talk marsupials, um, in other continents. But what we're working on is they're real Aussies. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have any plans to use virtual reality or 3D worlds to allow people to explore? Because it would be fascinating to see some of those uh, megafauna wandering around in the bush in the day and things so uh, you can actually look at it in 3D. It would be incredible. Absolutely. And that's definitely one of our plans for AIM4 of our project is how we get this information out there. So using the 3D technologies, it's not just uh, the caves either, we're doing the same with bones and, and you can do all sorts of 3D models. Um, I mean, it would be wonderful, what I'd love to see would be a virtual excavation. You know, you'd look awfully silly in a room with just a table sitting there doing this with a virtual reality, but that would give people a chance to see stuff that they're never going to be able to actually experience. So yeah, definitely. How many bones have you found? <laughs> 200,005, no, lots, lots and lots, yeah. There's, there's thousands of bones down there. Have you ever found any bones? Yeah, backyards are good for digging up and just checking out. That's bones. because the people who lived at our house before had a dog in the, oh. there <laughs> and then there was a lot of bones there because their dog oh, okay. chewed a lot of meat. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> okay, I think that's one of our paleontology majors for the future. Um, look, I think we might uh, leave it there. I'm sure Liz will be more than happy to talk to people afterwards. Um, can I just thank you all again? It's fantastic to see so many people turn out for these events. Um, thank you to Liz, and I do have a gift here for Liz. Thank you. Wow, thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you'll make good use of. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. So that concludes the event for this evening, but I'd just like to tell you that the next Research Tuesday will be on the 13th of March with a forum entitled Machines Rising. Uh, which will be presented by some of the members of our newly developed Australian Institute for Machine Learning. So thank you again. Good night.